have not wanted to be alive. I've only got two weeks of this. Depression, um, anxiety, suicidal Despite thoughts. I feel like I want to die. Hopeless and lost and debilitating, <sighs> tiring. This is every single month that this happens and it's all to do with my periods. I just can't cope. This is for one to two weeks of every single month. Every single month of my life. He basically told me it's just PMS and we don't know what causes PMS so there's nothing I can really do. Um, but eat more soy and take evening primrose oil. And I was just sitting there thinking, I was crying at the time as well, and I just thought, I've just told you that I was suicidal, and this is what you're, you're telling me to do, eat more soy. Hi everyone, I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist from Psych Scene. If you're new to this channel, we cover all things psychiatry and mental health related. So if that's your thing, don't forget to subscribe. As you know, we're doing a series of videos covering a range of psychiatric concepts. So today I'll be taking you through premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. So without further ado, let's jump into the presentation and find out what is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. PMS is a condition that affects a woman's emotions, physical health and behavior and usually commences about a week or two before a menstrual cycle. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is a health problem that is similar to PMS but is more serious. So when we look at it from a spectrum perspective, we often talk about PMS which does not lead to significant functional impairment but PMDD results in significant functional impairment and hence why we call it a disorder. So disorder in psychiatry is very much symptoms that impact on an individual's functioning across the board, relationships, vocation, occupation, social aspects, etc. Now we will be talking about PMDD here in more detail. PMDD is often underdiagnosed due to it being undifferentiated from PMS. However, PMDD is more intense with greater physical and psychological symptoms that greatly impair functioning and quality of life. So what are the risk factors for PMDD? Age, we have genetic factors, comorbid psychiatric disorders, psychosocial stresses, low parity, obesity, and smoking. Now with regards to the low parity, there is some evidence that PMDD, there's a greater risk in individuals that have a lesser number of children. And with regards to age, there may be a link between a slightly older age and the presence of PMDD. So less likely in the younger age group. But we find that from a genetic perspective that there, if there is a family history of PMDD, then the woman's more likely to experience PMDD as well. So how is PMDD diagnosed. For a positive diagnosis of PMDD, now we'll talk about the specific criteria in a sec, but generally just as domains, it's helpful to think about it. The presence of at least five of the following 11 affective, behavioral or somatic symptoms that are discreetly associated with the menstrual cycle are required. So we're looking at cognitive and affective. So that's one domain. Cognitive symptoms often mean memory, but it also includes executive function, which means planning, sequencing, our working memory, whether we're able to hold in a number of tasks together, the multitasking, set shifting. Uh, these are all important aspects of cognitive function. And what we can see here in the cognitive and affective section, we have affective lability, which is in other words, mood swings, tearfulness, heightened sensitivity to rejection. Sometimes patients describe it as being really snappy at small things being said by individuals in the family, for example, irritability or anger, depressed mood, hopelessness, a self deprecating thoughts, anxiety, tension, inability to concentrate, and a subjective sense of feeling out of control. Then we have behavioral changes such as a decreased interest in usual activities, lethargy, changes in appetite, or there were specific food cravings during that period, and changes in sleep could be either insomnia, not able to sleep, or excessive sleeping. And we have other somatic or physical symptoms such as breast tenderness, breast swelling, or bloating. So when we look at the diagnostic criteria for PMDD, Essentially, what we need is firstly criterion A, which is confirmed by prospective daily ratings during at least two 
symptomatic cycles. So the diagnosis may be made provisionally before this confirmation, but generally if a patient comes with a suspicion of PMDD, then we're looking for at least making sure that this is present for at least two cycles, that they're symptomatic for at least two cycles. And in the majority of menstrual cycles, at least five of the symptoms must be present in the final week before the onset of menses. And these start to improve within a few days after the onset of menses and become minimal or absent in the week post menses. So really looking at that premenstrual period as well. So what are the symptoms uh, that we're looking at? So firstly, criterion B, so remember at least five must be present as it says here, right? So we're looking at the following symptoms. As we looked at earlier, marked affective lability, mood swings. We're looking at marked irritability or anger or increased interpersonal conflicts, marked depressed mood, feelings of hopelessness, self-deprecating thoughts, marked anxiety, tension, and or feelings of being on edge. And then we have criterion C. We have one or more of the following symptoms, and this is to make a total of combined five when you combine it with this B, okay? So they could be four here and just one here, but essentially you're looking at Five, right? Then we're looking at a decreased interest in usual activities, subjective difficulty in concentration, lethargy, marked change in appetite, hypersomnia or insomnia, sense of being overwhelmed or out of control, and physical symptoms as we saw breast tenderness, breast swelling, sensation of bloating or weight gain. And then finally the disorder section that I talked about where there is a clinically significant distress or interference with work, school, usual social activities or relationships with others. And the disturbance is not merely an exacerbation of the symptoms of another disorder. So it is not because of another disorder that explains all of this, such as panic disorder, persistent depressive disorder, etc. And similarly, it's not attributable to substances. So usually when we're diagnosing psychiatric disorders, these three things are almost always present. Why? Because we want to make sure that the diagnosis is not due to other aspects that's present. So it's called ruling out. Okay, so these are the diagnostic criteria. If you're looking to learn more about this topic and discover a range of other stimulating psychiatry courses, then don't forget to subscribe to the Academy by PsychScene. So how is it treated? Now, there are a range of treatment options in PMDD. Now, what's really important here is that not all psychiatrists might have experience in the treatment of disorders related to women's mental health. So often what happens in these cases, what I tend to do is to work very closely with an endocrinologist. Now, of course, we've got a number of videos by Professor Jayashri Kulkani, who is the leading expert in women's mental health across the world. So do have a listen to her videos. She's talked about PMDD, she's talked about a menopausal treatment, etc. So often what happens is either a referral can be made to a specialist center, a psychoneuroendocrinology clinic, where individuals work together to treat disorders like this, or a good general practitioner working together with a psychiatrist. And the reason is because often medications such as oral contraceptive pills may be considered, which is one of the mainstay treatments. And for that, it's important that the general practitioner knows about this because some oral contraceptive pills have risks and one has to rule out certain contraindications as well. There may be risks uh, related to clotting, for example, if there's a family history, then some of the medications may be contraindicated. So there's a lot of specialization related to this. So it's important that the discussion needs to be made combined with few heads. I often think that two or three heads are always better than one. And here particularly, it's important to discuss this with the endocrinologist, could be a gynecologist, the general practitioner, and of course, the psychiatrist as well. Why psychiatrist? Because evidence-based strategies also include antidepressants in these cases, or we'll see certain other medications at low doses can provide a great deal of relief as well. So these are treatment options. As I always say in all treatments, please discuss this with your doctor. This is not medical advice. This is general education only. So what can we see here? Firstly, lifestyle changes exercise, reduction or moderation of alcohol, avoiding other drugs, good sleep hygiene, all of these things help. Then we have psychotherapies. Of course, I'll go to nutritional supplements in a sec, but I'll move down like this. So psychotherapies, CBT or mindfulness can help a lot. Let's go to nutritional supplements next. Now, 
this is one of those conditions in psychiatry where there is quite good evidence for a range of nutritional supplements at the right doses. So magnesium can help vitamin B6, which is pyridoxin. Now, what's really important here with pyridoxin is too much leads to side effects, particularly peripheral neuropathy. So it's important that it's prescribed in the right dose. Then we have vitamin D and often higher doses of vitamin D can be helpful. Calcium is evidence-based and vitamin E. Now the range of other complementary therapies as well, which I'll come to that are also beneficial. But as you can see, nutritional supplements can make a big difference. And what's interesting here is that we know that zinc, magnesium, B6, these three are cofactors in the manufacture of serotonin. And serotonin is closely linked to this disorder as well. Because often we find that in the menstrual cycle with the drops in estrogen progesterone that can affect dopamine serotonin levels as well. So let's look at the complementary therapies then. We have evening primrose oil, Vitex Agnes Castus, and these are often available over the counter in uh, certain pharmacies. Saffron, but always when taking over the counter supplements, it's crucial to discuss that with the pharmacist, with your doctor, because certain risks can be associated even with supplements that are considered natural. Say, take for example, kava. You know, kava was associated with a range of liver function abnormalities in uh, individuals. It's an anxiolytic. We have acupuncture, bright light therapy, reflexology, massage therapy. These can be helpful. And then we have pharmacological treatments. Now, in the pharmacological treatments, as you can see, SSRIs is evidence-based and often lower doses. So, escitalopram, fluoxetine, these are all evidence-based strategies that can be used in treating PM. DD. SNRIs such as duloxetine, desphenylfaxine are evidence-based as well. And then we have combined OCP. There is an algorithm, but of course the algorithm is really a sort of specialist input. So I'm not covering it here. I'm just covering it broadly. But if you are interested, do visit sightseenhub.com in the search box, put in PMDD and you'll see the detailed article where I go through all of this in a lot more detail. Now combined oral contraceptive pills, we have pills such as Yaz, uh, Zoli is recommended as very mood friendly, particularly by Professor Jayashri Kulkarni's group at the Alfred in Melbourne. This consists of uh, nomogesterol acetate with the estradiol. And also we have a, a drosiperinone containing oral contraceptive pills with ethanol estradiol tends to be uh, beneficial again. So these are the kind of oral contraceptive pills that have been recommended. But other more specialized treatments in GnRH analogs lower down when there's resistant cases, danazole, and then we have other medications for relief such as quetiapine. Quetiapine low dose uh, can help with the anxiety, agitation, sleep. Weight gain is a side effect which limits its use in many cases. And then we have alprazolam. Alprazolam, a short-term treatment, also anxiolytic, but a big risk of addiction and dependence. So this is something one has to be extremely cautious about. And then finally, in very resistant cases, we have surgery. Now this is, of course, a very, very specialist involvement. I had a full hysterectomy with both ovaries removed. I had to fight to have this operation because a girl at 38 years old, why would she want to have this operation and put herself in additional risks? I do know that my treatment that turned off my ovaries and put me into a chemical menopause and then my surgery which removed my reproductive organs, I do know that that surgery did 100% save my life. At the moment, I am on HRT. The gynaecologist saying, yeah, I know what PMDD is, and I just thought, oh my God. But now I have my life back. I just want everybody out there who is suffering alone, please don't, please reach out. There's support available. There are treatments that work for many people. There are so many of us out there. As always, do discuss all of these aspects with your doctor. These are treatable conditions. PMDD can be an extremely distressing condition for many, many women. And it's important that it doesn't get dismissed as just PMS, that it gets looked at seriously. And of course, as doctors in general, psychiatrists, it's important that we upskill within women's mental health in the field of hormones as a whole. Neurosteroids, hormones, thyroid hormones, etc., are very, very important aspects that impact significantly on the brain and can result in a range of symptoms. And hence why, please do look at it in more detail. I hope that you found this video useful. If you did like it, don't forget to leave us a like. Of course, subscribe to the channel to keep in touch with all the future videos that we are coming up with.
So with that, take care everyone, stay safe. Thanks a lot for watching. See you in another edition. Bye-bye. Synthesizing complex material in psychiatry to simplify your practice.